you should expect to get your bees through the winter. With modern gear and modern methods, you should expect to get your bees through the winter. Buzz. The problem with people not being able to get through the winter, there were many problems, but mainly they were using gear that was not modern and they weren't using modern methods. And so the bees died, which is what you would expect. But then it became this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. I practice and promote sustainable beekeeping. And sustainable beekeeping means getting your existing colonies through the winter, using them to make your own new queens or their new queens. They do all the work really and then uh, using those additional new queens and your splits to either replace uh, winter dead outs, it doesn't matter. This is the main thing about sustainable beekeeping. Uh, if you do it right, you don't ever have to buy bees again. I haven't bought bees in three years. I'm pretty sure that I'm not gonna have to buy bees again this fall. It also lets me say, when I sell my honey, all of my honey comes from overwintered hives. And this summer I'm gonna go on a blitz because I'm gonna to try to educate consumers to ask before they buy their honey at the fair or at the Saturday market or from their neighbor, did you kill these bees? And if the answer is yes, I'm encouraging them to say, you know, with modern gear and modern methods, you can get your bees through the winter and that will ensure that I continue buying honey from you. I'm not trying to do a boycott. I'm trying to spread the message. I'm trying to be an ambassador for sustainable beekeeping. Here's my history. First winter, all three made it through. Started with two, did a split, winter to winter with three, they all made it through. I thought, this is so easy. And then they all died. Look at that. That was my worst year. So I learned last winter, I got 10 of 12 through. I don't know how many of the 18 I have right now I'm going to get through, but I'm I only really want 10 coming out of winter, and I'm pretty sure I'll hit it. All in all, the last three years, 80% through the winter. That's really good. I think it can be better. I'm shooting for 90%. I like to say there's three Alaska beekeeping principles. The first one is to focus on beekeeping and not honey production. That's super important because if you're just trying to focus on the honey, you'll miss what would otherwise be the obvious signs about problems with your hive, about whether in fact their bees are even bringing any more nectar back to the colony. Um, you just miss so much. So we wanna maximize heat retention. Notice I didn't say heat the hive. I'm not gonna give you some weird strategy about putting a reptile heater underneath the hive to keep it warm. The bees make all the heat they need. Our job is to retain it. And then timely and effective winter prep. Now, these all go together. I'll give you a hint. I'm gonna do a completely separate class on overwintering. That's not gonna be covered this week or next week. But everything I tell you in the first two, in these next, this week and next week, will be building towards that. But if you do your winter prep late, you're killing your bees. And I see it every year and, and um, you know, I, it's, it's avoidable. I love this quote, art is the intersection of knowledge and experience. If you're a, need, if you're a new beekeeper, you don't have any experience. You may have knowledge, you may be watching uh, YouTube videos and reading books, but you have to figure out what that really means with your hands on. So if you're a new beekeeper, this is what your expectation should be. You're gonna get experience on the job training. That's what you're gonna do. And so you'll hear old beekeepers say, don't inspect all the time, don't take your time, except that you're gonna do that as a new beekeeper because you're going, what is that? You're gonna sit there, you're gonna take more time, get into it more often than you need. Everybody does it, go ahead. Just don't do it when it's super cold. Your goal as a new beekeeper is 30 frames of drawn comb. Drawn comb, drawn comb is gold in beekeeping. And by that, I mean not bare foundation, but all the cells are built out, okay? Um, you're going to have a basic understanding of colony behavior, not just from reading about it, but having watched it and going, oh, that's what they meant. And you're going to successfully overwinter your bees.
that's what you're going to do as a new beekeeper. If you're an experienced beekeeper, you're going to get more experience. We're all in that. You're going to get more frames of drawn comb because you can never have enough. You guys, you guys know a, 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 a frame of foundation, a frame of just foundation is about five bucks to cost. You, know. you can sell some of them for 15. You can't have too much drawn comb. You can also gift it to new beekeepers and they will love you forever. You'll get cookies. Um, you'll, you'll get honey the second year. Might you get honey the first year? You might. It should not be your goal because if you focus on that, you're going to shortchange other things. Okay. So and now we might have an amazing summer. Everything is climate dependent. We might have an amazing summer. You might start out with all drawn comb. If you go out and buy all drawn comb from somebody, you'll get honey the first year because your colony doesn't have to choose between, between drawing out comb and storing resources. Because it can't really do both to that degree. And guess what? If you're an experienced beekeeper, you're going to successfully overwinter your bees. So that's, that's what I want your expectations to be. Bee colonies are a super organism. That's really important for you to understand. That's that whole colony working together as opposed to individually. George came up to me and said, good news, we have dead bees. Any idea why he said that? Because well, bees die all winter long, individual bees. It's actually one of the signs of life of a winter colony is that bees are still flying out to die. When you stop seeing dead bees, you start worrying that there aren't any living ones in there. You know, because do we want to get every single bee through the winter? No, yeah, you just can't. You want that colony to get through the winter. You're going to learn to tell drones from queens from workers. It's really easy in a picture like this when they're all right next to each other, right? All right, so the queen has the long abdomen. She's, uh, if you're lucky, she's got a mark on her, um, but she's got that kind of bald spot behind her head on her, on her uh, thorax there. Um, the drone bees are short and squat and have gigantic eyes. That's not especially obvious here, but they have gigantic eyes. They have gigantic eyes because when they're looking for a queen, they need to see they need to distinguish queens flying at a distance. And then worker bees are smaller like that. And you get their relative size right there. Um, these are just some pictures of worker bees. You can see that if you've been looking at a queen or a drone, the worker bees look tiny. You know, Once you're looking at a whole frame of just worker bees, then you start seeing some size differential. If you're new, you go, that's the queen. No, that's the queen. No, but you'll get it. You will. Uh, drone, and short and squat, um, wide, and look at those giant eyes. You can really see that here. They have way more, they have a lot more eye material. How's that for being vague? Um, their comb is also different. Uh, the, um, see how in this picture, the tops of these uh, uh, brood cells are capped, they're rounded, domed? That's because drones are so big. They are they're big, and so the colony will round the top of that. So when you're looking at, you will be able to differentiate not only drones from workers, but drone cells from worker cells. But it's really easy, because they look like little bullets, and the others are just flat. Can you look at that and see where the drones are? Look for those big eyes and the wide bodies. They're the seven, 747s in a sea of 727s. All right, good, good. Um, and then queens. Queen cells look really different. Um, that's because if you think about the orientation of a frame and all the cells are horizontal, right? Queen cells are vertical. They build them out and hang them. So that's what you're seeing, a queen cell hanging off the side. And you can see that these queens, much larger abdomen, when it's a, mature, a sexually mature queen, they look like this. When they're a virgin queen, if they haven't gone out and mated yet, abdomen is much shorter, they are harder, but they do still have that pronounced bald spot on the back of their um, thorax. There. Um, all right, the whole works in here. So just take a quick scan. Um, is there anybody who can't find a drone in this picture? See those big eyes? There's a drone right there. You guys know the queen is right in the middle. She's nicely positioned. And she often looks like that. There's often a group of bees kind of around her, her retinue. And then all the rest are workers. Um, 
If it's if it, basically if it's too small to be a drone or a queen, it's a worker. This is one of the things beekeepers love to argue about. Um, they're an egg for three days. Does that mean they hatch on the third day or they hatch on the fourth day? We don't care for our purposes. They hatch on the third or the fourth day, close enough, okay? <laughs> they're a larvae, um, which essentially they start out as this tiny little comma. They grow into this grub-like thing. Um, and once they're ready, uh, the workers cap those cells and they pupate. They spin a little cocoon and they metamorphize from a a larvae into an adult. And on this column on the right, they emerge after that many days. Beekeeping, you're always trying to plan ahead. That's the kind of thing about experience you'll get. So you'll see how many bees are in your colony, but you have to know that if you see a frame of capped brood, that those are all gonna hatch in, let's say a worker brood, in 12 days. And each frame of brood you know, they're in there, think of them as in these tightly packed bunk beds, all right? They're really efficiently spaced in there, but once they crawl out, they take out much more space. So every frame of worker brood hatches into three frames of bees. That's how much more space they need once they're all moving around. And so when you're trying to figure out how many bees are in your hive, how crowded it is, you have to be looking ahead. You have to look at those capped brood frames and anticipate ahead. I can tell you that, you can go, yeah, that makes sense. You're just gonna have to go out and experience it. It's really just a different graphic representation of what we just talked about. The egg gets laid, they hatch you into a larvae. The larvae grows into a pretty big, um, well, uh, the tradition, the way they used to talk about it in like the 1800s, they always called them grubs. I do sometimes just because I've read some of that stuff. Uh, and then they cap it and they pupate underneath it and they emerge as an adult. Honeybees have this really cool haploid, diploid biology where all fertilized eggs are females. All unfertilized eggs are drones. When the queen lays an egg, she consciously decides whether to fertilize it or not. If she's laying an egg in a worker cell, just standard size cell, I'll show you some of this um, later, but She's laying a fertilized egg. Drone cells are bigger because drones are bigger. She's laying unfertilized eggs. Drones don't have a stinger. If you, if you want to play a joke on somebody that doesn't know anything about bees, grab a drone, put him in your mouth. Let him fly out. It looks very daring. It's really safe. They can't do a darn thing to you. Uh, it takes about two weeks after a drone hatches before they're sexually mature. So they can't mate with a queen for at least two weeks after. Now, remember, it also takes them 24 days to hatch. So 24 plus 14, that's 38 by my math. So if you start seeing drones, when we're trying to track colonies, if you start seeing a lot of drone cells, then you know that they're gonna hatch 24 days after they were laid or what is it, 12 or I, I can't remember now, but a certain less than two weeks after they were capped. Um, and then it's still two more weeks. You know when your colony is thinking about swarming, you can calculate ahead. This is one of the ways. It's not that you have to have uh, know exactly what's gonna happen. They're gonna give you clues on what's gonna happen two or three weeks from now. The presence of drones is one. So drones are really cool. One to four times a, a week, they fly to these things called drone congregation areas, which is basically some mystical thing that we don't know why it's there, but drones from colonies all in the area fly to those spaces. They fly, they stay flying 16 to 115 feet above the ground. And in areas with large bee concentrations, they could be 650 feet across. 10,000 drones to hundreds, from hundreds of colonies and they use those giant eyes to look for queens. <coughs> if they see a queen, it's on. There's a term for a whole bunch of drones following a queen. It's called a drone comet, because that's what it looks like. The queen in the front and this comet of drones chasing her. They die after mating. Um, and in the fall, they get evicted. The colony evicts them and won't let them back in. They'll chew their wings off so they can't come back in. So uh, um, 
I try to hide information like this from my wife. I don't want her getting any ideas. Um, but drones' main purpose, you know, is to is to um, mate with virgin queens, and and so they're big mouths to feed. Colonies will keep a few of them through the winter. Very few. No one knows why. Um, the they, how they decide which drones make it through and which don't. Um, but yeah, the, the vast majority, well over ninety percent, maybe ninety nine percent of drones are kicked out in the fall. You may walk up to your hive in August and see a thousand or two thousand bees dead in front of the hive and go, oh my gosh, what happened? And you walk up and notice that they are all drones. You go, oh, whew, this is what we would expect. Female bees, fertilized eggs. There's really no difference between a fertilized egg that's going to turn into a queen and one that's going to turn into a worker. The difference is in the diet they get fed. So we'll get into that. They, the same reproductive organs, but the diet doesn't let them fully mature. Workers are females and they can lay eggs, but they only do it when a colony becomes hopelessly queenless. And by that I mean they don't have a functioning queen and they don't have an egg or a larvae young enough to turn into a queen. Once the workers start laying, they won't accept a new queen. They'll kill a new queen. One of my pet peeves is when a, one of the local producers sells somebody that has a laying worker hive, a new queen. Those queens are going to die 100% of the time. The colony kills them. So um, we won't go into it a lot here. You're almost certainly not going to experience it your first year. But it's just important to understand that workers have the ability to lay eggs. Um, and, but since they've never made it, all they can lay is drones. And so your colony's dead as soon as they turn into a laying worker hive. Now, there's a few advanced tricks you can do to save some of them, like combine them with a colony. But really, um, it's a lot of effort. Um, and what you don't want to do is ruin any other hives you have by combining them in a way that creates a, you know, this Game of Thrones war between these two clans. And believe me, they'll do it, and I've seen it. It's not pretty. A mistake I made my first year. It happens most frequently in two scenarios. One is the beekeeper accidentally kills the queen. That's the most common one. It's super easy to do. Everybody does it. If you ever are talking to somebody who says they've never done it, they either did it and didn't know about it or they haven't had bees for very long. All you got to do is accidentally push two frames together and the queen's between one of them. You know, um, so that's common. Also, if a, queen, if a hive swarms and they have to make a new queen and that new queen either doesn't mate well or she gets intercepted on her mating flight, there's a lot of stuff that likes to eat queens. Seagulls really like them, spiders, birds, cars hit them. You know, there's a lot of bad things that can happen. Um, and so if that queen doesn't come back, they don't have any new eggs because they haven't had a queen, the original one left. What experienced beekeepers do in those situations, if you have multiple hives, is if they're worried about that, they'll take a frame that has young larvae from one colony and put it into that colony. And if they build queen cells, you know they were hopelessly queenless and you kept them from going laying worker. And if they don't, they think they have a queen. So um, that's something that we'll talk about next week. The tasks that they do in the hive are age related. Specific age bees do different things. This little graphic just shows that their first job is to clean out the dirty honeycomb. They graduate to feeding larvae, then building comb, which means they secrete the wax and then they mold it into shape. Then they become like receiver bees. They meet foragers at the at the opening and they take the pollen and nectar that these foragers bring in and then they take it and they to the cells where they're going to store it. They graduate to being uh, guard bees. 
then Undertaker Vs. Um, and finally, finally, they forage for nectar. Nectar, pollen, and water are the three things that they will bring back. These nurse bees, they call the youngest ones, grooming, cleaning, and feeding. Pretty straightforward. I can't remember how many visits each larvae gets, but it's thousands and thousands and thousands of micro feedings in the five and a half days that they're a larvae. <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. That's a great picture of a bee secreting wax out of their wax glands. These little flakes get collected and molded, shaped. Um, they clean stuff up. You know, this is the undertaker. This is just a different uh, definition. It's a great picture of guard bees, that bottom picture. Um, if you walk out to your hive and you'll see the bees on the bottom just kind of waiting. That's it. They look like they're guarding because that's what they do. That's what they do. And uh, if you ever watch uh, like a yellow jacket or a bumblebee or a bee from another colony try to fly in, they'll take issue with it. Um, and now they're doing temperature control. These are the bees that are getting, you know, they, depending on the hive. Remember, the needs of the hive also determine the roles. And the, depending on how the allocation is, they can, they can have bees of different ages perform tasks. If a hive, um, really young bees can't fly, excuse me. So in a swarm, you don't have the really young bees taking care of the new brood. They just kind of re, um, job retraining. <laughs> they go back and they do this other job because that's what they need to do. They only forage the last 15 days. They go out, they scout for resources, in the morning, they don't all fly out of the hive. Only scouts fly out of the hive. They come back and all these other uh, foragers kind of hang around just waiting for instructions. And then the foragers come back and say, hey, I found pollen or nectar or water. And they do the dance and they convince a bunch of people to follow them back out. People, a bunch of bees to follow them back out. And, and so if you ever are looking at your colony in the morning and you're, why are, why are so many bees here? Or why aren't they flying? Um, you'll also see this in the fall when there are very few re food resources, when the flowers start dying, is that you'll see very little activity and have a ton of bees on the inside. It's because the scouts aren't finding anything. They don't, can't give them the directions. Okay, queens, the only fertile female in the hive. Now, you know they can all lay eggs. Only the queen has fertilized eggs. She's the only one that can lay worker, female um, bees. The cells hatch on day 16. Takes about a week to harden off. Um, they hatch a little sooner than other bees, um, but their exoskeleton isn't fully formed. It takes about a week for it to harden off. They will fly five to seven later, five to seven days later, and they'll mate with 12 to 50 drones. The more, the better. The more, the better. And they return, they start laying eggs a few days later. There's a lot of, beekeepers love to argue over how many eggs a queen can lay. The answer is enough. <laughs> The answer is enough. Um, probably a thousand eggs a day, you know, is is probably it. People talk about documenting two thousand eggs a day. Yeah, I guess they historically lived up to five years. Now you're lucky to get a few years out of a queen, especially the commercially produced queens. There's all kinds of information about that. Um, in a nutshell, let me tell you, this is one of the important parts of sustainability, is to <laughs> Uh, be able to make your own queens, or like I said, let the hives make their own queens. Um, locally mated queens have uh, multiples of times more sperm stored, which means they last longer. They become infertile at a later date, all right? Um, and, uh, and so commercially bred queens are mass produced. Uh, there's a lot of research lately indicating they might not be in environments with enough drones. I mean, if you want 50 drones per queen and you're producing thousands of queens, you know, then how many drones do you have to have? You know, a lot is the answer, right? There's also some really cool research, come on, about the impact of pesticides and other viruses on drone fertility. So um, uh, 
So anyway, self-made queens are the best. If you need a queen and the only one available is a commercial queen, you should absolutely use that commercial queen. And, and last year was a bad year for commercial queens up here. I saw more queen failure than I've seen before. Um, and it's not a coincidence that last year, California had terrible weather in the spring. I don't know if you remember this El Nino year. They had lots of late snow. I saw pictures of these uh, um, almond orchards, which is where the bees go to pollinate. And then they make our, the packages that come to Alaska from those almond bees. And these almond orchards were covered with snow. And then everything melted. And the beehives had water up to here. The entrances were underwater, some of them. So it was a really hard year um, for bees. So with queens, the stinger isn't barbed, so they can sting repeatedly. It's very rare to get stung by a queen. There's people that'll tell you they have been stung by a queen. Most of them were handling a lot of queens and marking them. And so their fingers smelled like queen. And the general rule of thumb is there can be how many queens in the hive? One. And how does she take the presence of another queen? Not well. You know, I use the Game of Thrones analogy often because it was just this senseless bloodlust. It is the way they act. You know, they're just not going to tolerate it. Um, now, occasionally you will get hives with multiple queens. It does happen. It's extremely rare and we don't know why. If we could figure out why, we would encourage it because with two queens, you have twice as many eggs. Your colony grows faster. All right. Why does a colony make a new queen? Well, we talked about this earlier. The queen is injured and dies. That's almost always beekeeper error. Don't feel guilty about it, just learn. Um, I killed the queen last fall, I know I did. It's the only possible explanation for my one hive going queenless, you know, because they had a good laying queen, she was good. And even if a queen is gradually becoming infertile, the, the colony knows it and they'll start raising a new queen. Super procedure is queen starts becoming infertile, the colony says, you know, we love you, but the queen is dead, long live the queen. They're ready to replace you with another one. Um, and so the cells are in slightly different places. See these cells are in the middle of a frame. They're sticking out. Those are usually supersedure cells, usually. Swarm cells will hang down from the bottoms of the frames usually, but they'll also hang from any protuberance. So if you only have a comb on the top half of this, or yeah, if you only have comb on the top half of the cell, they'll put a row of swarm cells along the bottom of that row of comb. And people go, oh, it's not a swarm cell. It's in the middle of the set, over the middle of the frame. No, if it's hanging from something that sticks out, it's a swarm cell. What I'm saying is they do it for different reasons. If they want to reproduce, they hang it. They plant it ahead, they hang them. You know, they'll hang 12 to 20 of them. If it's a super procedure, they'll make like six of them. If it's an emergency, they'll make a bunch of them too. But the emergency ones, they didn't have time to plan for, and so they're usually in the middle of cells. They're wherever the best larvae were available because they didn't plan ahead and say, lay in these bottom cells where we're gonna raise a queen. The queen and about half the population fly away um, during this natural reproduction. When does that happen? When, when the cavity gets full. Um, you imagine a standard tree cavity, it's only so big. Once it gets full of resources and brood, then the colony says, now is the time we are going to reproduce colony reproduction. So they start building new queens. And when the cells are capped, um, then the queen and half the population fly away. So if you see queen cells, you'll need to take some kind of action. Uh, that's where being a member of a Facebook page is really important. Um, uh, or having a mentor, there aren't enough mentors to go around, but Facebook makes it that kind of virtual mentorship pretty good, pretty good. See how that top cell is shoot out from the side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The colony killed it or another queen killed it. If they have a little trap door on the bottom, that's the preferred exit. <laughs> and so uh, when you're looking at a number of queen cells and you see one or two that have the little opening at the bottom chewed open, but others have that, that's what happened. Is that, that's a queen that, that killed. Most first year beekeepers don't have to worry about this, but sometimes you do. If you start seeing queen cells, like I said before, you have to take some kind of action. The safest action is to convince the colony that they swarmed. And the safest way to do that is to take the queen and some frames of brood and put them in another box. They think they swarmed, they're now not going anywhere. The colony they left 
thinks there was a swarm and they got left behind. And so they just make the best of it. They, uh, they raise the queen cells that remain to maturity and the ones that survive have a big Game of Thrones fight and one survives and flies out to mate and comes back. The sustainable model that I think is the best for people is to have an extra set of gear, nucleus boxes, I didn't bring any, but they're small versions of these boxes. And when you see queen cells, don't panic. Find the queen, move her. Let them make a new queen. If they don't make a new queen, if she doesn't come back, you recombine them. Very low risk, high reward approach. With George and Michelle, they are living the charmed bee life. They had bee gear that they were gifted. They set it up in the backyard and a swarm moved in. They called me and said like, what now? So we, I helped. We got them through the winter. The next year they built up their colony nicely and they started doing swarm prep. We pulled the queen and, and then they made a new queen. She came back, started laying, beautiful new queen. So what'd they do with their extra bees? They sold them, <laughs> which you can do. They sold the split. You could also keep that and go into winter with both of them, thinking that if one dies, you have replacement bees. It all depends on how many bees you want to have. But this is a peek ahead about sustainability. If you only have one and that one dies, you have to buy bees. And I'm trying to keep people from buying bees if they can. And so having an extra hive is great, but you don't have to start with that extra hive. You can build up to it. So if you see queen cells, the main thing to remember now is you'll do something. You'll do something. What you should not do is tear out all the queen cells. Some of you may be going to other bee classes and you may hear other beekeepers tell you, yeah, just tear out those queen cells. Don't tear out those queen cells. I'm not saying you won't after you talk to somebody who's more experienced, but it, new beekeepers especially, it's hard to tell if the colony swarmed. There's still a bunch of bees left behind. You would think you could look and go, oh, there's not as many bees in here. They, they swarmed. Nope, there's still a lot of bees left behind. And guess what happens if that colony has already swarmed and you kill all the queen cells? No queen. What happens when there's no queen? Laying worker, dead colony, ruined colony. All right, so don't tear out queen cells. If you don't remember anything else I say, don't tear out queen cells. And really what I mean is as a first knee-jerk reaction to finding them. What you want to do is come home, calm yourself, post on one of the Facebook pages, I found queen cells, and then ignore everybody who tells you to tear them out, and, and pay attention to the people that try to get you to look at the bigger picture. Do they ha does the queen have room to lay? How crowded are they? Blah, 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 because it's a nuanced answer. You can't just get, you know, if you only have a, ton, a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? Well, we have a lot more tools than that. We can figure out what the problem is and there are different things you can do to take care of that problem. One of the things you can do if you catch them early is you can throw a lot more space at them. You can add an extra box right in the middle and they go, wow, maybe we shouldn't swarm and the hive itself will tear down those queen cells. But not if they're capped already. So it's a, it's a nuanced answer that depends on the details. Oh, I should add, take a picture so that more informed beekeepers, more experienced beekeepers can tell you, you know, that's a drone cell, calm down, <laughs> okay? Or they can say, that cell is capped. They probably already swarmed. Or those cells are open, you caught this in time. Here's what we can do. Okay, new queens are trying to figure it out. They'll sometimes lay multiple eggs in a cell. Um, so you can see in that picture, there's two two eggs in some of those cells. A laying worker hive will sometimes have five or seven cells in a hive. That's how you can tell it's a worker laying, is they just like, you know, scatter shot it. It's, it's very obvious. A new queen will never lay five, cell, five eggs in a cell. That's not gonna happen, that's a laying worker. And the, the reason that's important is because if your hive's been queenless, you're trying to figure out if your queen came back, you pull out a frame, you go, aha, look, I have eggs. Make sure you, it's not too many eggs, okay? But that's, that's for later. I don't think as first-year beekeepers you have to worry about that too much, unless you kill the queen. <laughs> uh, 
I talked about this before. It's only two goals. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to manage. You want to manage the way they build up their stores and manage the way they build up their brood. I am going to talk now about the population cycle. You see this? It's almost a beautiful little bell curve, right? Where um, you start off with a certain baseline population, queen's laying however many eggs she lays, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, enough. You get exponential growth. Then somewhere around solstice, they always say, probably around 1st of July, they know, they know <laughs> that summer doesn't last forever. And they start backing off. And so what I want you to notice, see that this is a chart that shows the mean daily gain or loss of bees. So when they're at their max, they're gaining 600 bees a day. 600 bees a day. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Attrition and recruitment. More recruitment than attrition. Look how that number reverses as it goes down. And then in the winter, they're losing, you know, 30 bees a day. All winter. It goes to zero in their chart, but in my experience, that's not true. That all of our bees come from California. All of them. Now, you can order queens from other spaces, but all of our bees go to pollination. They, bring, they build them up on uh, almond, po almond pollination. They bring them back. They split them. They create um, all these packages. There's 10 or 12,000 bees in a package. There's enough. They're young bees, mostly. They're shaking off a brood frame from large colonies. And the queen is hanging in a cage in the middle here. This queen is not related to these bees. They never interacted before until she got put in here. Now, the queen is going to start laying um, a couple of days after you release her. How long does it take a worker bee? And she'll lay almost exclusively worker bee eggs. How long does it take a worker bee to emerge? Anybody remember? 21 days is correct. And so for the first three weeks after your queen is released, you lose bees every day because you have attrition and no recruitment, right? At four weeks, you have about the same number of bees as you started with, and it doubles every two weeks after that because you're going to start these off in a relatively small space, and you'll have to add space once they start expanding. But you need to not get ahead of their schedule. Every year I get calls from people, they say, oh, there's so many bees, do I need to add another box? I say, how long has it been? Three weeks, I go, you have less bees than you started with. Relax, you're going to be fine. All right, this is the same chart, really. It shows how packages uh, that started, uh, by the way, the dates don't always line up on these because these, this research did not happen in Alaska. But, but the season is roughly the same, just more condensed. So you can see how these package bees um, just grow exponentially. Um, the bottom chart is how many weeks after installation. And so you can see that within eight weeks after installation, they're all over 30,000 bees. Yeah, just plenty uh, to get a honey harvest if you have drawn comb. Uh, now, this is where your appreciation for the spring buildup and the fall decline, I'm hoping, happens. If you, you know that if you have a package, you start with 10 or 12,000 bees. Um, if you have an overwintered colony, you're going to have about 10,000 bees. Okay, I think some of them overwinter larger. I know they do. Sometimes you look at them in, in April and you go, oh, holy cow, how did that happen? There's so many bees. Um, but let's just say around 10,000. That's plenty to start the colony again. How long do bees live in the summer? You guys remember? Six to eight weeks, yeah. Average age in the spring, our spring, is well over 200 days. Your colony has to raise bees in August and September that are not only going to make it through winter, but they're going to raise the brood for the next summer's population. You can see how the population just goes way up until it starts slowing down. And remember, the egg laying will start slowing down around the 1st of July, but she's already laid a ton of those, so the number of emerging brood will stay really high. And then it just precipitously drops 
and then they start rearing winter brood. It's a preview on overwintering. I always reduce the number of boxes I have before winter. And when I talk to other beekeepers, they resist that. They, re they go, I ha this has so many bees, but what's the population doing in August? Right. Remember how I said beekeepers always make decisions two weeks too late? Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to give them the number of boxes they're going to need in two or three weeks. You know, that population is dropping. So you're, you're, you're going to see this. A, a huge part of that drop off, by the way, is when they kick out the drones. So that's boom, they're gone. That's, you know, that's 10 to 15%. Why does the queen start laying less? Well, there's some environmental clues like the amount of daylight, you know, even though we still have a lot of daylight in June, right? But um, it does start to get a little cooler in late July. And um, people that live outside Alaska have a hard time when I say that. I tell them, yes, it actually does start to get cooler in late July. What happens when it gets cooler is flowers produce less nectar. So that's another environmental cue for the bees. When, when they produce less nectar, the bees clearly don't have as much to forage for, and the queen slows down her laying. The last round of short-lived summer brood emerges in August, and after that, it's these long-lived winter bees. And uh, the preview is, this is why it's so important to start winter prep early. If you're solely focused on honey production, then you'll wait until the last possible minute to harvest your honey. There's been no nectar for two weeks. Your bees thought it was a dearth, as in no more resources, so they stopped laying too much. They did not only slowed down, they stopped. I see so many posts of people saying, I don't have any eggs or larvae in my colony at that time of year. They still have their honey supers on, they still have their honey frames on, and they haven't harvested yet. The reason why you want to pull that honey on time is because you want to start feeding them. There's no more natural food available. And you do not want to mix sugar syrup with honey, right? Not if you're ethical, you don't. I know people that do, you don't. Um, I know of people who do. Um, you want to harvest that honey on time so you can start feeding them so they still think there's an abundance of resources and they keep the population high. I will give my bees a single pollen patty when, I, when I'm in late July or early August after whenever I pulled the pollen or whenever I pulled the honey. But you don't want to keep giving them pollen because it's actually that scarcity of pollen that triggers them to start raising winter bees. So you can actually hurt your bees by giving them pollen <coughs> too late in the season because you'll delay that winter bee production too long. Yes? What distinguishes a winter bee from a summer bee? The winter bees, as you can see from this graphic, have mittens and galoshes. <laughs> Look closely. That's where experience will really help. <laughs> the biggest mistake people make is they see all these flowers and they assume there's a lot of nectar out there. And so they don't harvest their honey. The reason it's important to harvest your honey, again, on time, is so that you can start feeding. So that you can start feeding. They are trying to build up large populations when resources are plentiful. So, and they are not going to eat through their resources hoping there will be more in the future. So anytime the external resources are diminishing, they are going to adjust their behavior um, in response. Um, so what is on time? Yeah, what is right, that's a great question. So, so when I'm, when I'm uh, my beehives have a top box, uh, that's above a queen excluder, which I didn't bring, but um, it, it's where the bees will store the honey. So this is a bit of a simplification. But if I go to check my hives in the third week of July, and I look down through the tops, and I can see that they're putting a lot of honey in there, and I can kind of tilt it up and go, oh, that's, you know, that we're lifted up and go, that weighs, I don't know, that's a medium amount of weight, or that, that's a heavy one, that's full. All right, I come back a week later, and I go, yep, still looks pretty good. Actually, still looks exactly like it did a week ago. What should happen in a week with a lot of nectar? It should get heavier. 
and there should be more comb drawn. If there's a good nectar flow on, your bees are drawing comb. And so when they stop drawing comb, they're letting you know there's not as much nectar out there. When you check and there's just as much or maybe even less nectar in your top box as there was before, they're telling you something. So when you know is when the bees tell you. But the problem we're here is confirmation bias, right? Look at all these flowers. I want all these, I want a large honey crop. I want all these flowers to have nectar. Therefore, I'm fine. <laughs> yes. Bingo. That's exactly what they'll do. Yeah. And, and every year, you'll see people who will, well, they'll pull out a frame and it will have drawn comb and no nectar in it. And they'll go, my bees ate all my honey. And they will have harvested their honey like in late August or early September. What happened? Well, they still saw flowers and they left their honey supers on. And, and you know, look, I'm sympathetic. Life happens too. People have to go out of state. They have medical emergencies. They have new kids and grandkids. I totally get stuff like that happens. So I don't, I don't mean to be shaming or judging. I mean to just turn it into a formula. When your bees tell you the season's over, don't argue with them. Don't argue with them. You know, I, one of my mentors who has been keeping bees since uh, the 90s, he loves to talk about the one year they had a giant fireweed flow. How many years? One. One year they had a giant flow late in the season. If you count on that big late August, early September flow, you're a loser 19 out of 20 years or more. It could have been a one in 50 year occurrence for all I know. So, um, and fireweed is notoriously fickle. It has to be just the right temperature, just the right humidity at, for fireweed to produce nectar. Two years ago, remember how hot it was? Remember, it was just so hot. It was so hot. Do you remember how all the flowers died in July? Yeah, nectar flow was over. I harvested, I harvested honey that year, July 5th. You know what I heard so many times? I never harvest honey until August. I go, what are you looking at? I mean, do you, no, nope, they, they, they get on a clock and they don't check. If they were checking, they would go, oh, wow, there's, there's, they're getting lighter. So I really hope, I really hope to buy a, um, to buy a hive weight this, this year, uh, kind of a Bluetooth hive weight, so I can just go out and take the weight of the hive, and and because that will tell you too. The hive's getting heavier. What's happening? Right? They're returning with more resources. Your first year, we don't want to harvest their honey because we want them to live. If we don't want to harvest their honey, right? So that's a really good question. Um, they probably haven't stored that much honey if it's your first year and you didn't start with a lot of drawn comb. In a first year, your colony is focused on building out comb and establishing that initial population, getting everything stable. Once you come through winter with a population, they are, they are storing right from the start. And so this, they have so much more honey. And, and what I'm really getting at is it is absolutely true that our bees overwinter better on sugar syrup than on honey. That is true. I know that sounds weird because we all go, well, how can, how can sugar syrup be healthier than honey? The answer is not so much that it's healthier. It's that it does not have any pollen in it. That's the difference between sugar syrup and honey. Honey has pollen in it. Pollen is a solid. Solids have to be pooped. Our bees have to go five plus months without pooping in the winter. They can hold up to a third of their body weight in waste. I know, it's good now when we're talking about pooping, right? They can hold a third of their body weight and waste, but that gets compromised if you're feeding them more solids than you have to. And so, that's why you don't want to, you'll see YouTube videos where they're putting pollen patties in in the winter. No, 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 no. You know, don't do that. But with a newer colony that didn't build up as big, didn't do as much resource store, then probably you just leave it in, feed them sugar syrup so they backfill the brood nest and, and they'll be fine. But you don't want them, you don't want them to have only honey, honey all winter. It's probably the best way to say that. Like if you did get lucky and they 
and they fill the whole box of honey for you, I would recommend that you remove that and then feed them sugar syrup. That's, that's basically our deal with the bees. We have, a, we have a handshake agreement. We'll take your honey, we'll give you sugar syrup. You overwinter better on it, and we would not have this agreement if honey wasn't more expensive than sugar syrup. I did not harvest any honey. I didn't pull any honey frames my first year. Um, and, um, and all three made it through. Um, just what you guys should expect. You've got to use insulated boxes. I don't think that the brand matters much. Um, I use BMAX. And the main reason I use BMAX is I started using BMAX and I want all my gear to match. It's not because I've done any comparison. In fact, BMAXs are actually a little narrower, not quite as thick as some of the others, but they're also less expensive for the same reason. Um, you need the correct setup, which I'll go through in a little bit. Um, and in essence, you want to ignore what everybody on YouTube says about ventilation. Not everybody. There's some really good new research on ventilation and moisture. Um, but the older stuff is just flat wrong. It's just flat wrong. Um, you want healthy bees, which means managing your mites. And you want, I talked about it, you want to start your fall feeding in time so your bees don't think they've gone into a dearth and stop brood production. I use emergency winter food. Um, I put a little bit of sugar on top of my colonies in uh, October. And I do that. Uh, probably 80% of my colonies use very little of it. And 20% of them use it all. Why is that? I don't know, you know. But my favorite kind of bees are living bees. <laughs> and so maybe, and I say that because some people might make the argument, you know, well, you know, they don't have the genetic capacity, you know, capability of making it through our winters. And I go, Right, but look, they're still alive. I can requeen them next year with a queen that has better genetics, but not if I don't get the colony through the winter. I also think it's really hard to add emergency food in the winter. Yeah, so I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. I actually started adding this uh, candy board right from the start because I thought, I don't want to open these hives up in February. I don't know how to do that. I'm a brand new beekeeper. It was very intimidating. Um, but it ended up working out really nicely for me and uh, for the folks that use that approach. My recommendation, if you want to practice sustainable beekeeping, is to focus on beekeeping. Learn everything you can about beekeeping. A big part of that is maximizing heat retention. Now, I didn't even talk about how bees stay warm. I don't know how many of you know it, but they essentially detach their wings from their flight muscles. They vibrate their flight muscles and create friction, and that friction heats the cluster. Now, um, all the old research, uh, which was done in places that are warmer than Alaska, we were taught that the ways bees like to get through the winter is they like to cluster tightly. The middle of the cluster is 70 degrees. The outside's 40. When the bees on the outside get cold, they crawl in the middle. Bees in the warm bees in the middle replace them. And their um, metabolism slows down. And yeah, right. So that's what we were taught. And you'll still find literature talking about that. You know what we know now? That's their emergency survival response. That is not their preferred survival response. When you put them in an insulated box that retains their heat, they heat the box. You will still find stuff that says, bees don't heat the box, they only heat the cluster. Well, yeah, if they're in a three quarter inch wood box that has an R value of less than one, they don't heat the whole box because they can't. <laughs> but if you put them in an insulated box um, where that heat is retained, thank you, then they do heat the whole box. Not, it's not all heated evenly. It's not like a perfect HVAC system like your house, unlike my house, which doesn't have a perfect HVAC system, but uh, it is heated up and they're crawling about on the inside uh, quite nicely. And again, start your winter prep in a timely manner. Blue.